Welcome to the Marriage Counselor's Corner. Right this way. Your therapist will see you shortly. In the meantime, sit back, kick your feet up on the couch, and get ready to focus on adding very valuable tools to your marriage toolkit. And now your host and marriage counselor, David Taylor. Hello, everybody. Did you miss me? You probably recognize this voice. If not, hang tight. This is the new beginning. That's right. This is episode number one of a brand new podcast. My podcast. And it's called the Marriage Counselor's Corner Podcast. And if you don't recognize my voice, I am David Taylor and I am your host. And I am excited I mean, excited, like this is, this is it guys. I'm, I'm back. <laughs> I'm excited to be here to um, go on this journey with you as your marriage counselor. And again, this is a brand new podcast called the Marriage Counselor's Corner Podcast. And this is a place where you will get credible and tangible marriage related information from a licensed mental health counselor. And if you're wondering who that is, well, it's me. Uh, if you don't know by now, you, you probably remember me from the Mastering Marriage podcast that I used to host with my wife or the For Husbands Only podcast that I did by myself back in about 2017. But, you know, when I promised to do 10 episodes and um, <laughs> I only made it to episode seven, I hear a lot, a lot from husbands who are constantly reminding me that I never finished the job. So I'm back. I'm back to not only finish the job, but to take this a step further. Um, and so, like I said, this is the very first episode of my brand new podcast, and I am so happy to have you here. And it is my hope that you and your marriage is able to benefit from our time together, right? Your time on the couch in the counselor's corner. Yep. I want your marriage to benefit from that time. And like I said, many of you guys, you know me from previous podcasts, you know me from our programs, you know me from our books, you know me from our social media presence, and now you're going to know me on a deeper level from my brand new Marriage Counselor's Corner podcast. See, after a rather long hiatus, uh, <laughs> I felt that it was definitely time to get back in the booth and to get my voice back out there, especially because I spend so much time working with marriages. Uh, and when I say so much time, you know, I'm working six, seven days a week sometimes with marriages, specifically dealing with some of the most uh, difficult situations that you can find out there. Um, so I'm officially back and I plan to be accountable to you this time, the listeners, right? And to be consistent with the production of this podcast. Uh, and with that being said, uh, this first episode, I actually am going to talk about some stuff. I'm going to do, you know, some marriage enrichment, but the first probably 10 or 15 minutes or so is going to just be me reintroducing myself and the concept of what this podcast is going to be all about. Um, so first for all of my listeners who don't know me, I would like to formally introduce myself and establish as much as I can, some level of credibility. And I understand that if you are new to listening to me um, and you're, you're wanting to find someone who has credible information, someone who espouses to be an expert in a certain space, well, you must qualify them first. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about me, my qualifications, what makes me good at what I do. And then I will share with you a little bit about how to use this podcast. And then after that, I'm going to go ahead and dive in and be off to the races with some new marriage enrichment information for you guys. Uh, so hang tight. Got some information to give you. So let me get through some, some introduction stuff first, and then we're going to dive right in. So my name is David Taylor, and I am a licensed mental health counselor for the state of Florida. I have been practicing psychology for the last 19 years. Um, I have my own private practice here in Florida, and I specialize in marriage and relationship counseling. Uh, and I deal a lot with that. Uh, I've been married for over 15 years now and have grown throughout my marriage to become a good husband. I work with marriages literally on almost a daily basis. I've published multiple books, and my most recent book 
is titled The 37 Laws to Mastering Marriage. And just to be honest, this is a really good book, not just because I wrote it, uh, but because this is the marriage handbook. It's covering 37 things that if you implement, if you practice, it ensures that you'll have a healthy marriage. So if you haven't heard about that, go ahead and check it out. It's on Amazon. You can get it from website. Uh, you can get the audio book, ebook, whatever it's out there. So um, anyway, in my first few years, uh, I just want to put this out there. This is in my books too and uh, uh, old podcasts. But in my first few years, I was extremely bad, like horrible at being a husband. Uh, so much so that I almost single-handedly derailed our marriage and it almost ended in a catastrophic divorce. Uh, and like I said, if you haven't read any of my books, like my first book, I said I do, but now I don't, uh, please do so. This book will provide a lot of insight into uh, my mindset and how that actually happened. Uh, and thank God for my wife, Amanda, if you guys don't know her or don't remember her from the podcast, I'm sure you do, but thank God for her um, as she stood for our marriage. And I did the work to heal. We reconciled and now we have a very exclusive coaching program called the Strategic Standard, where we actually help individuals who are in similar situations looking to recover and reconcile their broken marriages. Uh, and we're literally on the front line in our attempt to break the back of divorce. And if you remember, that was kind of like a tagline that we used to say, snap, crackle, pop, you know, little tagline thing. <laughs> but that's something that we are still adamant about. Uh, and speaking of breaking the back of divorce, that is the main aim of this podcast. So the Marriage Counselor's Corner podcast, the main goal is to really defeat divorce. Uh, and more specifically, I desire to give all marriages, those who are listening, the one thing that many marriages lack, the one thing that will keep your marriage alive and active. Now, I'll talk about this more in a second when I go into my marriage enrichment mode. But for now, uh, let me let me stay on track. Just know that while you are on the couch at the Marriage Counselor's Corner, you will get real, credible, tangible, researched, and unbiased information from a real marriage counselor who happens to be in a healthy marriage, right? So this is not going to just be my opinion. Um, I'm not going to just, you know, give you points to just, you know, entertain your t or tickle your ears. I'm going to actually give you stuff that will help the heart of your marriage thrive and grow. And as haughty as that may sound, the details do matter, right? What I'm qualified to do, my experience, those details matter, especially, especially for the husbands who will be listening to this podcast. The tools that I will give you work, not because I'm so smart, but because these tools have been applied, tried, tested, vetted, researched over time. And so I am merely the vessel on an assignment looking to serve my gift. And this podcast is the platform by which I will do so. Got it? <laughs> now, I got that out the way. Let me go ahead and move forward to uh, what you should expect when listening to this podcast. First, I will be producing a new podcast once a week, and they will go live every Monday. So expect for the episodes to be anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes long, depending on the topic, depending on how deep we go. Like today's podcast episode will probably be around 40, 45 minutes long. And I want you to see these episodes as a master class in marriage, where I take a psychological and practical approach to marriage education and enrichment. And here, I will assume the role of a teacher, the role of a coach, and the role of a therapist. And as the listener, all you have to do is come prepared to receive tips, tools, and resources that will take your marriage to the next level. Now, with that being said, in addition to the teachings, because I am doing weekly episodes and I want to be consistent, but I also want to make sure that you guys are getting all of what you need from these uh, uh, this resource. Every other Monday will be a special episode where I answer questions that you, the listeners, send in to me. Now, back when we were doing the uh, Mastering Marriage podcast, I would get questions. And I, and I have questions dated all the way back to like 2016 um, in my email inbox that I never got to answer on the podcast. 
And I want to make sure that as you guys send them to me, I am doing my due diligence to answer those uh, answer those questions that you send in. And see this as a live, brief, but informative coaching session, right? Where all of us are gathered together and I am, you know, taking your questions and answering those questions live. And depending on the length, I will do two, three, sometimes four questions per episode, depending on how long when did I get, because uh, your brother can talk, I will talk. Um, and so, uh, s- my vision for this podcast, though, at, at least at the moment, will be to provide two educational episodes and then two Q and A style episodes per month. Um, and who knows? Perhaps I will venture into doing some interviews at some point. But for now, expect high quality and specialized content for your marriage in the form of teachings and Q and A episodes. Okay, so. We're going to do some teachings. We're going to deep dive, right? We're not going to skim the surface. We're going to go deep and we're going to also do some Q&A. And that way I'll be able to answer some questions, to deal with some things that you guys are dealing with so that you can kind of apply the teachings to whatever area of concern that you may have. And speaking of questions, because again, I will be doing these Q&A episodes. Um, there will be three ways for listeners to ask questions for those episodes, right? You can email a question to me directly at David at masteringmarriage.com. So you can just, you know, email it, type it up, and then I'll read it live. I can keep your name out so it's anonymous. You can also submit a live recording that I will play on air. And you can do this by going to uh, the website, marriagecounselorscorner.com. So marriagecounselorscorner.com. And click in the gray send voicemail tab that's at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. And you can record your question. And it's free, easy, and anonymous. You don't have to say your name. Uh, you can <laughs> change your voice. Really, you can't change your voice. But like you, you can keep some of the detailed information to yourself and just ask the question. And that way, I can play the actual audio question live before I answer the question. That way, you guys can hear the question, and then I can respond accordingly. So that's the second way you can submit a question. The last way you can submit a question is through Facebook Messenger. And again, you can send a voice text or you can actually just text or you can, you know, attach it if you want to. But you can just find me by going to our Mastering Marriage page and you can leave a message that way. It's private. Nobody can see it. So I can get your question and then I can read it live on air again. So those are three ways that you can send a question. Please, now that you know, Go ahead and start sending those questions in because probably the third or fourth episode, depending on how many questions I get, may be the first Q&A episode. So I'm really excited about that. So let's go ahead and get that going. Send those questions in so we can get that portion of this podcast going. So anyway, we're going to get to answering these questions. Uh, and here's here's how I want you guys to think about this. Um, this will be an opportunity for many of you who share similar struggles to get insights and tools that you could begin applying immediately into the garden of your marriage. So I may answer one question, but I will be speaking to many of you throughout my answer, right? Like thousands and thousands of you guys throughout at the same time. And so I'm going to try to answer it in a manner that helps more than one person get what they need. And as I recently alluded to, the answers will be coming from a licensed professional and a seasoned therapist, uh, not someone who's masquerading as a relationship guru, right? So I'm not positioning myself to be a relationship guru. I'm positioning myself to be who I really am, a relationship expert, okay? And um, that may sound haughty for some, but anybody that has any amount of years invested in experience, invested in it, you can you can be an expert if, as long as you're good at your craft and let other people qualify you at that. Um, so anyway, moving on. Uh, I, I also highly recommend subscribing to this podcast so that you don't miss any episodes. And you can find this podcast on iTunes, uh, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and any of the other platforms that host uh, podcasts. You can find it there, okay? So just uh, subscribe to it so that every time it comes, a new episode comes out, you don't have to run to the website to listen to it. You'll get a notification on your phone, okay? And just so you know, I used to have a goal of reaching a million marriages. 
And well, we did that with our first podcast. So my goal is, is much, much broader. Uh, I got to put more weight on my shoulders. I want to reach 100 million marriages and I want to severely break the back of divorce, right? This is a systemic thing that we got to get in and, and change the system of marriage. And so I got to uh, reach as many people as possible. And you guys, the listeners, you can share it, comment, like it, uh, send in special requests in terms of topics, send in your questions. This is how we spread the message. And I want this information to be consumed by anyone looking to grow in their marriage. And I'll need your help to do this. So please don't hesitate to share this information. Uh, and also, most definitely, leave a comment and a review of this podcast. So whether it's iTunes, whether it's Google Podcasts, whether it's Spotify, leave a review. And then that way, it's promoted higher, right? Uh, with our Mastering Marriage podcast, when it first came out, it was a top-ranked podcast for a while. And let's see if we can get this one up there, too, so that more ears can get uh, this information. Uh, so especially during the first month of the launch. Anyway, I thank you guys in advance for that. So now that I've covered the things that I need to cover, I figured I'd also spend some time touching on a topic that is crucial to your marriage. And I'll be talking about this concept. The one thing that is more important than love. So grab your notebooks, get a pen, and go ahead and let's get started. So, let me ask you guys a question. What is the most important component of marriage? Well, I have the answer for you. So, if you haven't come up with an answer already, let me give you the answer to this question. And some of you guys may have heard this before, but I want you to stick with me because this is going to go deep. So, the thing that is more important to love that you can possibly incorporate into your marriage is knowledge. Yes, knowledge. The Bible says it this way in Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. Now, some people may be thinking now, what about love? Because isn't love like the most important thing to your marriage? And I'll say this, love is very important to your marriage, right? Very important. As a matter of fact, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But knowledge, that's the one thing that if you don't have, you will definitely struggle inside of your marriage. So love is not the foundation of your marriage, but it's integral to the health of your marriage. But knowledge is the foundation. It has to be. Everything that's in your marriage has to be built on knowledge. Let me give you some stats. So about 50% of all marriages end in divorce, right? So like if you take first-time marriages, second-time marriages, and third-time marriages, and you add all those up, the divorce rate is roughly 50%. But to be more specific, about 35% of first-time marriages end in divorce. Around 50% of second-time marriages end in divorce. And about 75% of third-time marriages end in divorce. So if you look at it, we're not getting smarter <laughs> the more times we marry. We're actually getting worse at it because people often get married stuck in their ways, never learning what they needed to know that caused their first marriage to fail. And so they take those patterns, those bad habits, all of that with them into their next marriage, and they just replicate the same process. But a successful marriage, and this is something that I've been studying, guys, a successful marriage is due to the application of knowledge. You have to have knowledge and you have to be able to apply that information. And I know for us, you know, when we got married, I was head over heels smitten by Mandy. We said some very incredible, very poetic wedding vows, expecting to make it work just on the love that we shared. But you know what? We were way off. And there are some very important things that you have to educate yourself on if you want your marriage to succeed. And when we first got married, we didn't do that. Think of it like this. Are you licensed to drive a car? Most adults, <laughs> if you're driving, you have your driver's license. And anybody that has their driver's license had to be qualified in order to obtain that license, right? So you had to take a driver's test. Some of us went to driver's ed, right? You had to get your learner's permit and practice with supervision. 
And then you had to get your driver's license, right? But you just couldn't walk in and say, I'm ready to drive, so give me my license. You had to prove that you were qualified and credible enough to have the license. The same is the case with any license that you have, right? For me to practice psychology, I had to go to six years of college to get my, my bachelor's and master's degree. And then after I got my master's degree, I had to spend thousands of hours in the field working underneath a supervisor who I had to have thousands of hours of supervision from to qualify myself to then take this huge state exam to pass to get my license to practice psychology independently. And then every other year, I have to take continuing education credits just to demonstrate that I'm still qualified. If you study law, heck, if you are a barber, a plumber, right? Anything that requires a license requires you to obtain it through qualification and credentialing. But your marriage license, that's one of the few licenses that you can get and you don't have to demonstrate qualifications for it. You don't have to demonstrate that you are mature enough to manage and obtain and hold that marriage license. You don't have to qualify for it. All you need is a willing participant and a witness and a couple hundred bucks, and you can go to the courthouse tomorrow and get married, depending on the day of the week, right? So that's one of the few licenses that you don't have to demonstrate aptitude. You just get it. And then when people get it, they expect that, it just works. Well, I'm here to tell y'all, and y'all should know by now, if y'all been married for any amount of years, healthy marriages just don't work. Just like healthy cultivated gardens just don't grow. You have to till the land, manage the garden, protect it, work it, prune all the things, get the weeds out, make sure that you ain't got pests coming in and out. There's tons of things you have to do to ensure that your garden is healthy. The same is the case for your marriage. Now, To help you out with this, I want to give you eight areas. And I know there are many, many of these areas, but I'm just going to give you eight very important, like the top eight very important areas that you must have knowledge in. So again, if knowledge is the most important thing to your marriage, here are eight areas that you must have knowledge in. Now, I'm going to briefly go in depth. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all of these eight areas, but I will kind of break it down a little bit just so that you know what they are. But then it's my desire for you guys to take this information and start to study it. This is how you acquire knowledge. Okay, so take this information, go deeper than where I'm going with you. But I'm just going to take you to the door. You get to walk in. So let's start with the first area. Number one of the eight areas that you must have knowledge in is you must know love. Now, this is important because most people get married and they are already in love with their spouse or they love their spouse and they're expecting that this type of love, whatever that feeling is that they're having, is sustainable, is the thing that will help take them over the moon. And I'm here to tell you guys, it's not, right? Most people get married using the wrong type of love. This is why you have to understand what love is. And when I'm using the word love, I'm referring to something very specific. Often in America, when we say love, I could say I love the Lakers and I love my daughter in the same sentence, or I love my wife and I love uh, bowling in the same sentence. And most people will understand that, okay, I'm meaning something different, but not specifically, right? Not all the time, because I'm not being tangible or very specific with what, when I use that word love for my wife, what is the difference between that love and the love I have for bowling? Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about why you must know love and the specific type of love, right? So in the Greek language, one word had a multitude of meanings. And so that's why one word would be broken down to different words. So for instance, the word love, there's many meanings of love in the Greek language, but I'm just going to refer to four of the main types of love that we often associate when we use the word love. So they had storge, They had philea, and storge is the type of love that you would have for your siblings, family member, uncle, mother, daddy, cousin, brother, sister, auntie, that's storge. And philea, that's the type of love that you would have for a best friend, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. That's the love that you would have for someone that you're not related to, but you're very close to. That's philea. And then there was eros. Eros is where we get the base word 
erotic or eroticism from. It's the romantic type of love. This is the love that often causes people to want to get married. It's that thing that they feel, that butterfly. It's the I can't sleep without thinking of you type of love, right? It's the romantic stuff. And actually, you know, some cultures would say never get married if you have this type of love because it makes you do crazy things. And trust me, I know because then I get couples coming to the office a lot and saying that they are no longer in love with their spouse, that those feelings are no longer there. They're not compatible. They're not connected anymore. They're not attracted to them anymore, right? It's because that eros has died down. Well, that's the third type of love. And then the fourth one, which is the one I'm really referring to, is agape. And I know most of my Christian scholars, you guys have heard about the word agape. You know what that means, right? That's the supernatural type of love. That's the type of love that it makes permanent relationships like marriage possible. Agape love comes from a source outside of you that's greater, that's sustainable, and it has nothing to do with how you feel. Agape love is an act of the will. It's a choice, a deliberate decision that you make, and it's all about giving something unconditionally to the other person. It's not about what you can receive. It's not about what you can get back in return. It's all about a gift that you give. And I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this because I will most likely do a whole podcast uh, devoted to just this topic. But just know that agape love is something that you must have and you must know in order to have a healthy marriage. And really quickly, I'll just define it as to give all that I have all the time, right? So to simplify it, agape love, the unconditional type of love means to give all that I have all the time. And just know that marriage and love inside of your marriage is not about 50-50. It's not about 100-100. It's 100-0. Agape love is a one-sided contract, right? So think about that. Go out, study it, understand it, ask more questions. Hit me up, send me a question. I'll do more in depth when I do the q and I'm also going to do some teachings on this. So, and... The very first chapter of my 37 Laws to Mastering Marriage book, the very first law is the law of agape. So go check that out if you want to. All right, number two, and this is the second area that you must have knowledge in. You must know yourself. Now, this may sound basic and cliche, but oh, it's so true. I Listen, I see this all the time. You get married thinking that you have an understanding of yourself only to realize that your marriage is bringing out of you stuff that's in you that you don't like and maybe don't even recognize. You have to understand what makes you you. And to go a step further, you have to know why you actually got married, right? What what was it that was driving you? Not she was such a good kisser or she had a great body or he he seemed to be a great provider. No, there was something deeper, deeper. And often when I say deeper, I mean connected to your childhood, connected to your trauma that motivated you, energized you to see that this was the spouse that you should marry. That's something that you want to uncover. Now, let me talk a little bit about why getting married here in America is so complicated. And often it's because we get married because we think we know what we want, right? We get married because we are in love, because of how we feel, because of how you make me feel, right? That's really why we get married. But in other cultures, they get married for a completely different reason. So their motivations for for positioning themselves in this long-term contract is completely different and not driven by how they feel, by what's churning on the inside. They often get married to extend the family and enhance culture. A lot of times it's also for political reasons. And they choose to love their spouse until they feel in love with their spouse. But most people, especially here, that's not how we marry. Most people marry to meet their personal and often subconscious needs. This is important. Most people marry to meet their personal and often subconscious needs. Subconscious meaning you are not aware of what those needs are. Most people feel like they don't have needs until you get married and your marriage, trust me, will flush those things to the surface. For many of us, 
our childhood was marred with wounds that we are still protecting and trying to find closure to as adults. Many of us are still trying to heal from the trauma of our childhoods. And as adults, we're often seeking from others the needs that were never met in our childhoods. As a matter of fact, and I know I don't want to spend too much time on this point because it's only number two, but most of us marry the ideal version of our parents that we never had. I married the ideal version of my dad. I found that out (laughs) after I got married that I had daddy issues. So be thinking about that. You must know yourself in order to have a healthy marriage. Number three, you got to know your spouse. This is important, guys. Um, I got a chapter in my book uh, called The Law of the Pupil, and it talks about how it's so important for you to actually know your spouse on a much deeper level. So just like you have to understand your own connection, the connection between you as a spouse and your childhood, you want to understand that for your spouse as well. You want to know their childhood trauma and how it impacts who they are, how they show up inside of the marriage. Now, not only just the deep stuff, you also want to know some of the medium and surface stuff, right? And there's there's some cool ways to make sure that you're learning your spouse. And by the way, you have to be a student of your spouse at every stage of their development, right? So just because you knew them as high school sweethearts or first three years of you guys dating, guess what? The moment y'all have kids, both of y'all are going to change. So you got to make sure that you meet them where they are, not where you want them to be or not where they used to be. Give them permission to change and then grow with them. A good way or a cool way to allow this process to transpire is what is called a love map quiz. And so a love map quiz is just a series of questions that you answer about your spouse. Really simple. Until you start answering those questions and you're like, wait, I don't know some of these answers. So I'm going to give you 10 questions real quick. So I'm going to give you 10 questions that you can incorporate into your love map quiz. This will help you just better know your spouse. So question number one, can you name your spouse's best friends? What's their names? Do you know them? Have you met them? What are your thoughts of them? Can you name their best friends? Question number two, are you able to tell me, not me specifically, but are you able to tell your spouse what stresses they are currently facing? What are they dealing with? What are the major stresses of their lives? Number three, I know the names of some of the people who have been irritating my spouse lately. Do you know who they can't stand to be around? (laughs) Do you know that supervisor? Do they talk about to you, that supervisor that's irritating them? Number four, can you tell some of your spouse's life dreams? Do you know what your spouse's life dreams are, or at least some of them, right? That should be an answer that you can provide. Number five, I am very familiar with my spouse's religious beliefs and ideas. Can you tell their theological beliefs, their religious beliefs, the ideas that they have about God? Um, the questions that they have about the Bible or about God or whatever belief that they carry, can you, do you know their religious beliefs and ideas? Number six, I can tell you about my spouse's basic philosophy on life. What is your spouse's basic philosophy on, on life? What's their moral compass? How do they generally view human beings? If they were to drive up to someone who's homeless on the side of the road, What would your spouse be thinking about that individual and their situation? That's an answer that you should be able to provide. Number seven, I can list the relatives that my spouse likes the least. So who are the relatives (laughs) that your spouse really don't like to be around? You should be able to list those. Number eight, I know my spouse's favorite music and musical artists, right? So you may have known this when y'all first met. But what about today? Y'all been married for 15 years, for 17 years. Do you know your spouse's favorite music and their musical artists that they prefer the most? You should be able to provide that information. Number nine, I can list my spouse's three favorite movies. Now, if you're like me, this is something that you're going to have to write down because 
Uh, my wife's three favorite movies can be different depending on the day. Uh, but she still has a few movies that she would consider her favorite. Do you know your spouse's three favorite movies? This is the question that you should be to answer. Again, part of the love map quiz. And then number 10, my spouse is familiar with my current stressors. Are they familiar with the things that stress you out? That should be something that they should know, but it also means that these are details and pieces of information that you should be providing to them. All right, guys, let me go to number four because uh, there's a lot of information to still cover and I want to make sure that I get you guys out of the office in a good time. So number four is this. And again, we're talking about the eight things that you must know in order for your marriage to be healthy. Number four is you must know the purpose of your marriage. Every marriage has a purpose. And if you aren't aware of your purpose, often you will be drifting through life. And I've found that it's the purposeless marriages that struggle the most because they're not building anything together. They're not working towards anything together. Together, They don't have goals that they're trying to accomplish. What is the purpose of your marriage? Is it just to procreate and have kids? Or is there something greater that you guys are tied and connected to? My wife and I, our purpose, one of our purposes is to impact a million marriages and to break the back of divorce. And so we are working tenaciously now that she got her podcast, I got my podcast, the books that we write, the programs that we offer, right? We're working tenaciously to do our part to fulfill that purpose. What is the purpose of your marriage? You must know that in order to be guided. Otherwise, the drama and the small fires of life will start to taint and interfere with your daily functioning inside of your marriage. You must know this. This is how you stay from getting distracted. This is how you stay from allowing the small foxes to spoil the vine. Is if you have a greater purpose, then you're going to be ascending above a lot of the negativity, a lot of the drama that you may find yourself in if you lack purpose. So know your purpose. Number five, also know the season that your marriage is in. So uh, Dr. Gary Chapman has this really great book called The Four Seasons of Marriage. And in that book, he talks about how you have either winter, fall, spring, or summer. And each marriage will often go through each of those seasons. Some will stay in some seasons longer than others. But for the most part, you'll find yourself at some, depending on the stage of your marriage, in one of those seasons or you will cycle through all of those seasons. And what I found is that often couples misconstrue the season with the health of their marriage. So they may find themselves in a winter season. And if you buy the book, you'll read that in winter, there's not a lot of growth. There's not, not a lot of movement. It's cold. There's not a lot of life giving in that season, right? And so you may find yourself stuck in a winter season thinking that there's something wrong but it's because you're in the season of winter. And often if you overlook that season and you don't leverage it, that's when you'll start making things worse because you'll make decisions based off of the season, not understanding why you're in the season. People try to rush out of the uncomfortable seasons instead of understanding that, wait a minute, maybe this is the season that we need to get the weeds out because there's not a lot of growth. So we're not going to be distracted by the kids. We're not going to be distracted by moving in our careers. So let's take this time to de-weed our marriage so that when we get into spring and summer, we can kind of be a little bit more uh, hands off. We can coast a little bit more. We can enjoy our time together a little bit more. There are seasons where you work and then there are seasons where you rest. And if you know the season that you're in, you could properly leverage that season. Again, go get his book, Dr. Chapman's book, The Four Seasons of Marriage. That'll give you much more information. But trust me, study this, know this so that you understand. You got to know what fall looks like and what it feels like. You got to know what summer looks like and what what it feels like. You got to know what spring looks like and what it feels like. Don't just be expecting to be in a perpetual state of spring or summer. Understand that you will oscillate through different seasons of your marriage. All right, number six, know your support group. This is important. I see the healthiest marriages often have the healthiest, more robust support groups. And sometimes it could just be an individual, but often, and I actually recommend, especially with the couples I work with, 
find another couple or two that you trust that has credibility, that has history, that has knowledge, like a married couple that's ahead of where you are, that is where you want to be, that can help hold you accountable and pull you up. Maybe someone that's where you are, a couple that's on a similar level that you guys are on that can kind of keep you afloat, keep you balanced. And then maybe someone that's where you used to be that you can pay it forward, that you can bring in to the fulfillment of where they need to be. Okay. And if you have a a support group that's well-rounded, it'll keep you, your marriage well-rounded. Jim Rome says that you are the average of the two to three people that you're the closest to. Or Actually, I think he says three to five people that you're the closest to. Well, your marriage is the average of the two to three couples that, it, that it's the closest to. So you want to make sure that you have people that's not about drama, that's not about negativity, that's not about infidelity, people that's been there, done that, they know how to work through conflict. They know how to communicate effectively. They know how to share affection, right? You want those types of individuals in your inner circle. You also can include people like a therapist, a coach, a pastor, a mentor, right? You can include other individuals in your inner circle, but make sure you have at least one couple that you can also look to. And I get it in this day and age, especially with half the marriages failing, it's, it's, it's harder. It's, it's easier said than done. So you may have to look a little farther to get it <laughs> or a little longer to get it, but you must have a support group. Okay. Let's keep it moving. Number seven. And we're almost wrapping up these eight things you must know in order to have a healthy marriage. Number seven is, you know, you must know your plan for the next three to five years of your marriage. Again, this is important. I, I can tell you stories. When we first married, Got, when Mandy and I first got married, I didn't I didn't lead effectively. I didn't sit down and say, "Hey, let's let's discuss a plan for the next two to five years of our marriage." And as a result, uh, we got I let me be honest, I got us into some severe financial uh, difficulties and struggles early on in our marriage. Right, we came out the gate. I had my own house. We got a house built, so that gave us two properties. Well. The first two years into our marriage, we had moved, and those two properties, this was at the, during the economy where the bubble had burst, those two properties ended up going into short sales. And we ended up, I ended up ruining, and ruining our credit for probably the next five years of our marriage. And so I had to put that weight on my shoulders to say, you know what, I got to fix this for us because it was my fault that we were in that financial situation to begin with. I didn't have a plan. And because of that, it cost us a lot. So you want to make sure that you position yourself such that there's a plan, a tangible plan. Like we talked about knowing the purpose. You also want to have a plan for what your marriage should look like. You shouldn't just get married and accidentally have a baby. Now, hear me clearly. I'm not saying that the baby, you know, shouldn't be here. However, it's better to plan the birth than to just randomly get pregnant and have the baby. You want to make sure that you're planning things like having kids where you're going to live, how long you're going to live there, moving, career, right? Because guess what? Surprises are going to happen. Stormy seasons are going to come. And I often say that surprises are cancerous to your marriage. And so if you have a plan, now you can't plan for everything, but if you have a tangible plan that's around the basic areas, child care, finances, health care, uh, vocation, location, family, if you have a plan around those areas, it'll help you to endure the stormy seasons that will come. And trust me, they will come. Speaking of stormy seasons, let me go to the eighth thing that you must know in order to have a healthy marriage. Number eight is this, you must know the plan for the stormy seasons. So just like you have to have a plan for your marriage in general, three to five years, you got to have a plan for the stormy seasons. How are we going to endure or what are we going to do if one of us loses our job? Well, maybe we plan to plan for that. We live off of one income and we save the rest or invest the rest. Right. Uh, Maybe, you know, what's the plan for having kids? What happens if one of us has uh, a sickness or an illness? Uh, What happens if there's a miscarriage or the death of a loved one? We got to have a plan for those things. We got to at least talk about those things, right? And some people may say, well, I don't want to think about the negative stuff and I don't, well, then you're going to be surprised when the negative things happen or when the stormy seasons happen and you have no plan. 
right? That's like here in Florida. We have hurricane season every year. And so we make sure that once we know storms are coming, well, what's the plan? What are you going to do if your utilities goes off and you don't, you no longer have electricity? What's the plan for that? Do you have batteries? Do you have a flashlight? Do you have food that's just stored so that it's not contingent on your refrigerator? Do you have water? Right? These are things that you want to make sure you have. You don't, we can't, especially here in Florida, if there's a storm in the middle of the storm, we can't go out to go get the things we need. That's why you get those things before. And you want to make sure, especially in your marriage, that you're having a plan for the stormy seasons. Because stormy seasons come, and they're not always bad. We need the storms. We need the rain. But for the most part, they can be bad. And you want to make sure that you're planning for those things as well. All right, guys. So there you have it. I've given you eight things that you must know. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take these eight things because I know y'all was taking notes and I want you to discuss these things with your spouse, especially the areas of these eight that you haven't really started to focus on. I want you to begin sharpening your saw in the area that you are struggling the most in. Okay. Spend time discussing this with your spouse. Maybe go back and listen to this with your spouse, take some notes and then hit me up. Let me know if you have any questions about these things, because guess what? I want to make sure that I'm also doing my part to help you move through these seasons as easy and efficient as possible. So with that being said, I just want to say thank y'all for coming to the very first session at the Marriage Counselor's Corner. I hope it was comfortable in the office. You know, I have to make sure the lighting was right. Hope the couch was comfortable for you guys. And um, I want you to make sure that you join me in our next session. Because in the next episode, we will be talking about another very important topic that you don't want to miss out on. And the only way to get it is to make sure that you're subscribed to these podcast episodes so that you can hear what I have to say when I have to say it. And that's every Monday. Also, Please don't forget to go to our marriagecounselorscorner.com website to leave your questions. All right, guys, I appreciate your time and I look forward to seeing you back here on the couch in the Marriage Counselors Corner. Talk to you soon. Deuces. Thanks for stopping by for your seat on the couch at the Marriage Counselors Corner. Remember, go to marriagecounselorscorner.com to schedule your next session. Also, Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss a session. We look forward to having you back on the couch soon. Bye-bye now.